Christianity and also worship on Saturday. They sort of popularized this. The, the Seventh-day Adventists became a group in about 1863, and at that time they had about 3,000 adherents. What distinguishes them is that they don't believe in hell. I mean, not as, a, not as an eternal punishment. They believe in some form of, form of annihilation. They are, I understand, vegetarians, and, and that, that's rather distinguishing. Their most popular adherent today, I think, is Ben Carson. We know Mr. Carson, and he's a practicing Seventh-day Adventist. By the way, Advent has reference to the second coming of Christ, and so, of course, we certainly agree with that. What I want to do tonight is to take up four of the main arguments that are used just, just for your interest, I know that I doubt anybody here is confused about this. It's not why I'm preaching it. I, I just think it's very interesting to talk about this because I want you to love Sunday as much as I do. And you talk about a faithful Christian. S- Sunday is the, is the centerpiece of our week, isn't it? Monday's important because you got to go back to work or to school. And Saturday's important because most people have Saturday off. That's not true about preachers, but have Saturday off and that's kind of fun. But, but the centerpiece around which everything else revolves is is the Lord's day. It is the Lord's day. And here as we conclude this one, and we're together worshiping, let's focus our minds on, on some of the arguments that are contrary to us worshiping on the first day of the week in favor of the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. All right, here's the first one. Can we throw it up there? The Sabbath command was given in the Garden of Eden and is thus universal for all time. This is a, this is a big argument. Now, it is true that, that God rested on the seventh day in creation, right? So let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. And I've got these verses. I'm going to make reference to a lot of passages. I'm not sure that you can turn to all of them fast enough. But by the way, I, my habit is to write my sermons in full sentence outlines. If you ever want a copy of whatever I preach, I'll be happy to email it to you. And because it's in full sentence, you'll be able to understand it and you'll have those passages like tonight. And this may be an occasion such as that. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Now, just just parenthetically, and I, I put this... In the next part, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Sabbat. The word rested there is the verb sabbat. And in its noun form, we say Sabbath. And so, you know, there you have it. Now, God didn't rest because he was fatigued like you and I get tired. It wasn't that. It just means ceased. It means he stopped his work. But, but what's interesting is that this, this was put in, and it was put in as sort of a, a precursor to what's going to happen with the law of Moses when we get the Ten Commandments and remember the Sabbath day and, and keep it holy. So here you have it. I would argue that this phrase, and I've got it underlined, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, is not about creation. It's about a foretelling of what's going to happen in the Ten Commandments. God is going to sanctify it and make it holy and make it blessed. At this time, it is mentioned in creation. Seventh day, God ceased and rested. He rested. Isn't it interesting? And maybe you haven't thought about this, but in reference to the Sabbath day, you have this reference. But in in all of the, the patriarchs in the book of Genesis, you're going to have thousands of years before anybody is described observing the Sabbath. Which of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis can you think of that observed the day of worship or holy day of the Sabbath? And the answer is none of them. None of them did. They didn't understand it this way. They didn't understand it as being something that was put in place at at creation and was applicable to all generations until the trumpet blows. That's not how they saw it. Now, having a day of rest at the end of the week is something that I'm, I'm convinced even pagan people did. That's not what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about, we're talking about a holy day called the Sabbath. So when God gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, He connected it to, to creation 
rest. Exodus 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you'll labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Skipping a bit now. For in six days the Lord made heavens and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now watch this. So in Exodus 20, and you have the Ten Commandments listed twice, remember. Once in Exodus 20, and then later in Deuteronomy, they're restated because now the people of Israel are actually going into the land of Canaan. And so there's a repeating of the Ten Commandments. So in Exodus 20, the the connection is made for the Sabbath back to creation because God rested on the seventh day. But when you do it in Deuteronomy, it goes back to releasing from Egyptian bondage. Deuteronomy 5.15, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Why? Because he he delivered you out out of that Egyptian bondage. But it wasn't established as a religious practice until the Ten Commandments. It wasn't. Now, It's very interesting what Nehemiah has to say about this. I'm in Nehemiah chapter 9 now and verse 13. I want to read something from Nehemiah and then from Ezekiel, from these two prophets. Nehemiah 9, 13. You came down also from Mount Sinai. This is the getting of the law, Moses getting the law, Mount Sinai. And with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws and good statutes and commandments You made known to them your holy Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? He speaks to them not as a people who have always practiced the Sabbath because it started back in the Garden of Eden. He speaks to them as people who are now being introduced to something. You made known to them your holy Sabbath at Sinai, at the giving of the old law, the the law of Moses, and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. Now, here's another one. Here's Ezekiel now. The prophet Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 10. Listen closely. Therefore, I made them go out of the land of Egypt. There's that deliverance. We're headed toward Sinai. We're headed toward the the commands of God written on tables of stone. I made them go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes, showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I'm the Lord who sanctifies them. Is it the case then that the Sabbath was something that was a holy day all the way back to creation or was the creation looking forward to the time in the, in the commandments of God, the law of Moses in Exodus chapter 20? And that, that's the answer, of course. It was that. And this, there's the place at which it became a holy day and it was an ordinance of God to be practiced by the Israelite people. Now, here's the second argument. Some parts of the Old Testament law were meant to be temporary and others were meant to be permanent. Well, that's very interesting. Now, we're not confused about this. I mean, we understand that, that some things in the Ten Commandments, for example, are things that are also discussed and commanded in the New Testament, right? I do not commit adultery, but I don't stop from doing that because of the Ten Commandments, I stop from doing that because of Galatians chapter 5, because of what the new law, the New Testament says. How many of the Old uh, Testament, how many of the Old Testament laws or the Ten Commandments are you and I obligated to today? None. None. Shouldn't we obey the Ten Commandments today? I mean, Aren't some of those things in the New Testament? Yes, but we don't obey them because they're in the Old Testament. No, we don't obey them because they're in part of the Ten Commandments. We obey them because they're in the new law under which you and I serve as Christians. So back to the point. Some parts, it's argued, of the Old Testament law was meant to be temporary and other parts permanent. And so here's how this is framed, is that the Ten Commandments had both ceremonial laws and moral laws. And the ceremonial laws were nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14, that they were, they were done away with. And in the ceremonial laws, you have things like animal sacrifices. So when the New Testament came, those were gone. But then there were moral laws. 
And this is going to get kind of clever here. You ready? Okay, the moral laws. The moral laws would be, well, things that were moral. So you have, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness. And honor, uh, the, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What they did was to stick the Sabbath day in with the moral laws so that it would seem permanent. Well, I think, frankly, that's a stretch. I, 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 I've tried to figure that out. I cannot, but that doesn't matter. So here's the point, is that you have this division that they have imagined, and it is that the law of Moses is not the same as the law of God. Two different things. The law of Moses is the ceremonial law. The law of God would be the moral law. The law of God, the moral law, lasts forever. The one that is Moses' law, the law of Moses, ceremonial law, it doesn't last forever, and Jesus nailed it to his cross. The problem with it is that that the prophet Nehemiah, at the occasion of the completing of the wall of Jerusalem, stands right in the way, just like that wall, to this argument. I'm in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1. And watch now, because Nehemiah and others, this is just an example, will use the law of God and the law of Moses, those terms, interchangeably. Same thing. All right, the law of God is the law of Moses. It's all the same thing. You can't, this is an arbitrary and imagined distinction. Nehemiah 8 verse 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses. I underlined it for you so you could see it clearly. The book of the law of Moses was what Ezra was to bring, which God, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And Ezra was supposed to read that to the congregation. So you get down to verse 8 of Nehemiah 8. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them understand the reading. In other words, there was no such distinction that's been imagined. And for what purpose? It was imagined in order that people could say that we aren't to worship today on Sunday, that we're to worship on the Sabbath day, because some parts of the Old Testament were meant to be permanent, and surely the Sabbath was meant to be meant to be permanent. Let me do one more before I leave this point. It's Nehemiah chapter 10, 29. These joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. God's law which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe all the commandments of the Lord our God, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. You see, Nehemiah, you see, he doesn't know. He doesn't know about the Sabbatarians and the arguments they're going to make, apparently, and he just has this notion by inspiration that the law of God, the law of Moses is the same thing. Here's number three, same thing. All right. Number three, God intended that the old law would be for both the Jew and the Gentile to live by. If God wanted to do it this way, it would be okay with me, but that's not how it was set up. That old law was a school teacher, a schoolmaster, preparatory to bring us to Christ, Galatians chapter 3. So when you get to the Ten Commandments, and verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It was given exclusively to the Hebrew nation. It was given exclusively to the Israelites and never to you. I'm looking across this room right now, and so far as I know, we are all Gentiles in this room exclusively, and you've never been under the old law. You never have. wasn't written for you or to you, and you've never been responsible for it. Here's Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 1. Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, This is, by the way, just before the Ten Commandments are restated, relisted, just before that. Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. How about that? The, the the patriarchs in the book of Genesis were not amenable to the law of Moses because they died before it started, before God gave it. And that's the point here that's being made by Moses is that it, it wasn't for them. Who was it for then? It was exclusively, he said, for us. It was just for us. And, and I, one of my favorites is the Ark of the Covenant. When you open up the Ark of the Covenant and you look in, what do you see? 
What's in the Ark of the Covenant? Here's 1 Kings 8 and verse 21. And there I have made a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now look at those words very carefully. The covenant of the Lord. All right, this is the covenant of the Lord. This is the law, which he made with our fathers. This is in 1 Kings 8, so some time has passed since Sinai and the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So that's when this covenant was made on Mount Sinai, brings them out of Egypt, Mount Sinai, Moses gets the law of God, including the Ten Commandments. Verse 9 of that chapter says this. Nothing was in the ark, excuse me, except the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. That references the Ten Commandments. That was the old covenant that was to be superseded by the new, and the Ten Commandments are thus not binding today. They were binding on them, but to nobody else. Here's Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant. This is interesting. He's talking about the New Testament. The New Testament. (coughs) You have a copy of it probably tonight on your lap. The New Testament is the law under which you and I serve God. Jeremiah is prophesying about that new covenant, the New Testament. It hadn't been presented yet. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. When I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. <clears throat> Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. We just got through seeing what that was in the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, and the law of God. <coughs> Pardon me. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Make a new covenant. It draws a contrast between the Old Covenant, the Old Testament law, and the New. Hebrews 8, verse 6. (coughs) I'll get past that. Excuse me. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also the mediator of a better covenant. What you've got in the New Testament, to which we are amenable, is better. So, I, I would probably want to stick this in now. You know what? We're not confused about the moral statements of the old law and the fact that we're not responsible for the Ten Commandments, that that was for a specific group of people at a specific time and that that time is not now. And Colossians 2 and 14 says that the old law was nailed to the cross. Those, those ordinances that were handwritten, and you know they were handwritten by God originally, and they've been nailed to the cross that doesn't mean that we're free to murder and steal. (coughs) Why? Because the New Testament prohibits that. Not because the old. All right, one more. Let's do one more. This is from Luke 4 and verse 16. It says that the, the custom of our Lord was to go and worship on the Sabbath, or rather to... Okay, if I have to quit, we'll quit, but I'm going to be fine. I'll be fine. Came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And so the argument is really pretty superficial, I think. It says, well, there you are. Jesus went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and that was his custom. And therefore, Christians today ought to worship on the Sabbath. I think I think surely this must be self-evident to all of us is that, well, of course he did. He was a Jew. Of course he did. Christianity didn't exist yet. It wouldn't exist. He, he had to die for the church to be established, Ephesians 5 and 25. He had to die first on the cross, and then the church was established not long thereafter, and he ascended back to the Father, and you have Pentecost, and he was a faithful Jew. Remember, though, that's not our question. The question is, on what day should the church meet for our main weekly assembly? Well, ask some questions and you'll have the answer. According to the New Testament, on what day should the church meet for our weekly, our main weekly assembly? When was the Lord resurrected from the dead? 
And I mentioned it a while ago, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1, he was resurrected on the first day of the week. Why was that? In fact, the passage makes, makes this distinction, and it says, Sabbath being ended, and at the dawning of the first day of the week, he was resurrected. Isn't that interesting? It would have been, it would have just been so easy, you know, to, to make it on the Sabbath day that he was resurrected, but that's not how it was. And some distinction was made about that point. On what day was the church established? I I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is very interesting, I think. Leviticus chapter 23 talks about the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is the same thing as Passover. It's just another way to describe it, the Feast of Weeks. And and when you go there, the, the way you determine when the Feast of Weeks happens or the day of Pass, of uh, Pentecost, it, it happens, you count seven Sabbaths, and it's the day after that. So Pente, for Pentecost, means 50, right? Pente, 50. And and it's it's just there. I mean, so what it says in Leviticus 23 is that you, you count seven, seven Sabbaths, seven times seven, that's 49. It's the day after that. That's Pentecost, all right? When was the church established? Acts chapter 2, in the first of the chapter, says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. And then he describes the beginning day of the Lord's church. Why? Wouldn't it made, make better sense if, if the intention of God was to continue the, the Sabbath day as he did for the old law and the people of Israel, wouldn't it make better sense for him to do it on Saturday? Shabbat. But no, that's not what happened. Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. The church was established on Sunday. Ask the third question. When did the people eat the Lord's Supper? When did the early church eat the Lord's Supper? Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. He continued his speech till midnight. Now, Now get that. For what purpose did they assemble? To eat the Lord's Supper? On what day did they do that? On the first day of the week? And then let's do one more. So on what day of the week did they come together to bring their monies to be part of the the treasury for the church that good could be done with these funds? And the answer is 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2 on the first day of the week. And parenthetically, the, the Greek says this, on the first day of every week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God's prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. That's fascinating to me. That's when they assembled. When the early church assembled, it was on the first day of the week to carry out the worship and to worship in the truth, the spirit and the truth that God had miraculously inspired them to do. I've always loved Sundays. Sometimes I say that if I, if I was alone on a deserted island... I hope I wouldn't be alone. I hope Cindy would be there. But anyway, if, if, I, if I didn't have a clock or a calendar, I, I sort of think that I would still know when it was the Lord's Day. I don't know that for sure, but I sure have been practicing worshiping on Sunday for an awful long time. It's the center of my week. Everything else ro- rotates around this, not because I'm the preacher, I don't reckon, but because I'm a Christian. This is, this is important. This is sacred. It is deliberate. This is the Lord's day. I decided t- today that, that at this evening time, when we were finishing up the day, I would talk about the Lord's day. And I hope you will always treasure it. I hope you always will. We hope you have enjoyed this lesson from God's Word, brought to us by Glenn Colley. If you have comments or questions, Glenn can be reached by email. Speech on. Hearing devices, headphone, Apple TV, camera, flashlight, calculator, timer, button, selected, screen recording.